Hello everyone, it's October 9, 2021, and welcome to a very special episode of the Geo Files. And as you can tell, this is not the Geo Shed. We are in a hotel in Green Bay, Wisconsin, because tomorrow our goal is to go to Iron Mountain, Michigan, and do some intense, detailed geologic mapping of the Vulcan Iron Formation. This formation is old. We're not talking thousands of years or millions of years. We're talking billions of years old, close to 1.85 billion to be exact. And why are we going there? Well, well, some of you have already seen some of my posts of this rock I found when I was up there with the ISU in September. And at first, it's just like a lithic sandstone, a lithic aronite in particular. There's almost no mud in it. Nothing impressive, you know. And it was in the pit where, where the iron formation was. And then I started looking at it under magnification. And there's some really weird looking stuff. Unfortunately, the rock was not in place. It was just laying on the ground. I am curious to see if I can find this in place in its natural outcrop to determine its origin. But in order to do that, I need to understand the iron formation. And it's not that simple. The Vulcan iron formation has been mined for well over 120 years. As a matter of fact, the first publication on the stuff that's really good is back in 1904. And it actually has a detailed map of where we're going, well, for 1904. Nothing, well, some things were named, but the names have changed and things like that, but that's neither here nor there. We'll address that as it comes to it. But the map I'm mostly gonna be going on was done 1966. And we are gonna be right here, almost due north of the Keel Mine. Now, the thing with the Keel Mine is you Google it and in places it's spelled K-E-A-L and in other places it's K-E-E-L. I don't even know when it was open. I know in 1904 it was still open, the date of that earlier publication. However, there seems to be another pit, which we are going to go look at that pit because we have permission to get there. there there's only a handful of units we're going to deal with here. The oldest is the Ranville, and that has an unconformity on top of it. And then we're going to have the Felch Formation, and we may or may not see this in outcrop. Depends. This site, I've been going to this site for years, and it has changed so much. So the exposure changes and things like this over time. But then you get into the Vulcan Iron Formation, and that's basically, there's three recognized members locally. Two of them are known to be present where we will be, and is the Basal Traders and the above lying Briar Slate. The Traders is Banded Iron Formation, the Briar Slate really isn't. And then above that, you have the Curry, which is another Banded Iron Formation. Then occasionally you have this Loretto, which seems to be lenticular, probably because there's an erosional conformity on top of it. Some of us aren't really sure about that nomenclature, but that's why I'm going there to take detailed, very accurate, precise measurements and get a couple of samples here and there. Nothing for dating purposes. That's not the point of this. Because if that piece of rock is ejecta from the Sudbury impact, we'll know exactly how old that is. We plan on doing a very limited area in great detail. It's basically the area we plan on doing. Hopefully we can get to most of that. Weather permitting, it does look like it's gonna be an okay day, not a great day. Uh, these sites do not appear in the roadside book because they are on private property. Uh, otherwise, they would be great places to put in there, at least for banded iron formation in a relatively built up area. But, the, but this is part of the Menominee Iron District. But anyway, we're gonna go to bed because it's late, get some sleep, and we are going to get up early in the morning and start our day, try to see if we can figure this thing out. It is October 10th, 2021, times about a quarter to 10 in the morning, and this is where we're going to start. But before we get into it, I'm gonna show you some of the tools I will be using today. Now. This is a standard field book, and I use these all the time. I'm going to start a brand new one today. Hammer for breaking rocks. This is my hand lens for looking at things up close. I need to get a lanyard for it so I can wear it around my neck. This is a GPS, which I am going to turn on now and put in my pocket. 
this is engineering tape. Now, since we're in the U.S., it's in feet, but it's not only in inches, it's also in tens of feet. And you might hear me switch between imperial and metric. I apologize. It's kind of something that happens when you're a child of two different systems. This is my rock bag. This is the camera equipment. Here's sample bags. These are maps that I have. And this is where we are according to this map and not much work has been done since then. We do have Bailey from 1904 who did the groundbreaking work. A guy named Bailey also helped on the 1966 publications but it's a different Bailey. Uh, so we're going to be using some of his stuff too. This is the main reason why we're here. This, this guy right here. This is a little bit of an odd piece and when I looked at it under the microscope I thought it might <laughs> be it's a sandstone that's physically what it is but the grains look weird and I it looks a lot like it could be Sudbury ejecta mixed in with banded iron formation this is the Vulcan iron formation that's what this is and it is mostly banded iron formation it is divided into members not even gonna pay attention to that here behind me is north all right, we're gonna start over there at that cliff face down there. And after those measurements are done, we're gonna go to other places, but I'm looking for this rock in place. This was not found in place. It was found right about over there. Uh, not at the wall, but, but not that far in front of it. Now, there's a little bit of an oddity here. The Vulcan Iron Formation, the Sudbury Impact, which was about 700 kilometers east of here. The ejecta's been found as far west as 1,200 kilometers from it. So we're kind of halfway between that. And it has been found in this area, but the problem is if this is from the Vulcan and, that, and it is ejecta, uh, well, it should be at the base of the Michigami Formation, which is supposedly behind Sarah, who's recording to the south. So, <laughs> It's, it's a little bit of a problem. So I figure the best way to tackle this is to use typical ge geologic tools in the field and to just start measuring and taking samples of this along the way. Let me show you how I do some of that stuff like that. I forgot the most important tool of the trade uh, because it's on my belt, which is the style at the time, is our Brunton compass. It wasn't on there. I keep it here so I don't lose it. So this is what we use to take strike and dip, which is attitude orientation of rock. I think we should get started. Uh, it's supposed to rain on and off throughout the day, but we should be all right. If you look at all this float, I'm just laying around here and excavating it, and you see specular hematite, almost pure hematite in some parts. It's all over the place, but this stuff isn't in place, so it's not good to use it as a guide. We've got to go to the actual outcrop. Something I forgot to mention, too. This pile right here, this used to be an impact block a few years ago. Then it was demolished for whatever reason and piled up here. And I did study that before it was demolished a little bit. I didn't have a lot of time, and I thought that some of the beds might repeat almost like there was a tight fold here but that was preliminary and the more I've learned about the geology of the area the more I don't think that's the case I think the original interpretation of this just being steeply bedded stuff is correct but that's something we're going to address today unfortunately that big mound there is gone so let's come up the hill and start over here Oh, look at this. This is good. Typical chunk of banded, good banded iron formation. You see the iron minerals. Here it's mostly hematite, but it can also be magnetite and geotite, but it's usually hematite. And here's the jasper, if you will, which is mostly here in a lot of places. It's a purple quartzite. Oh, some pieces too. You can see sedimentary structures. 
Now we still argue about the origins of banded iron formations because this is the only sedimentary rock Earth no longer makes. And we aren't dealing with thousands of years or millions of years here. We're dealing with billions. Like I said, we know this is about 1.85 plus or minus billion years. But here you can see ripple marks. So we do know they're sedimentary. We just argue about whether they're biological, chemical, or a combination. Because the thing about all these rocks is how old they are. At best, we might find some stromatolite mats here. I think there are some here. That's it. Single-celled organisms and colonies of this organism. There's no macro fossils here. There's no trilobites. There's no gastropods. There's no vertebrates. There's nothing like that to get a good framework for origin of what this rock actually would be. That and the fact that Earth doesn't make it anymore makes its actual interpretation of origin difficult. We still have our first stop here. I just want to show you this. It, it looks like a thin to thick bedded, pretty much typical banded iron here. Uh, it's got a, it doesn't have a lot of jasper in it. There are some slaty parts and stuff like that, but you have here, it looks almost like a breccia a little bit in places, filled with what's probably quartz calcite. I haven't tested it. So you get some interesting features on some of this. Okay, I'm going to take strike and dip of this. You can tell by looking at it, strike's about this way. Dip, that's vertical, is going to be that way-ish, somewhere towards the north. Now, you got to do this from a rock that's in place. And I'm going to do it off this bed. This seems to be a good bed. Look, it doesn't seem to change orientation that much. So this is a good place to measure strike and dip. We got a nice flat plane here. We measure this, we always measure our strike and dip to north. Our strike is gonna be either north, west, or east, some number. North, some number, west or east, that number is in degrees. And I use a quadrant one. I don't use a degree brought in compass, why? Because if I'm facing, like I am here, southish, that needle, which is white, tipped, is pointing north, which is that way. Now, I gotta make sure I don't have any magnetite in this to throw this off. So, it doesn't seem to be messing with it that much. But I'm facing southish, so my arrow is gonna be facing southeast. But since this is a quadrant, I'm going to read it northwest. I don't have to do any math with this. I just look 180. So if I get south, 30 east for my strike. I just get rid of the south, change that to north, leave the 30, change the east to west. And that'll give me my, my strike, and then I get my dip. Now that's a little different. But let's get our strike first. Looks like here we have about north 53 east, and I'm gonna try to confirm that here. It is messing with it a little bit magnetically. All right, so to make sure I'm not getting that interference, I'm going to look directly down at my leveled compass. So it looks like, okay, we got about north 63 west. So north 63 west. Even though you can see the arrows pointing south, I just read it that way. Now, our dip by definition is always perpendicular to our strike. And since we have a northwest strike, our dips are either northeast or they are southwest. There's no other option. And they're dipping this way. And if you look at my compass needle, it's kind of pointing to the northeast. Now, some of you might be saying, well, east and west are flipped here. That's a talk for another time. But the, this is a direct read compass. So I am actually facing northeast this way. That is not, you know, it's not flip, that's not northwest. You just gonna have to trust me on that because that's a topic for a whole nother time. But we are dipping northeast. So to get dip, now my strike is about right here. So my dip, you see, I don't know if you can see through there, that top bubble is what I'm worried about. And it's about centered right there. Now you only need to be accurate to about a degree, maybe two. It's not the end of the world. If you're not. So our dip is 64 
northeast. So then we write that down. And this is how you write it. I've started constructing a map as we go. There's our GPS, stop 1A, here's 1A, took a little sample, north is this way. There's our strike and dip. And there's a description, uh, uh, this is actually more of a slate. It's a ferrous slate, it's an iron rich slate, not really a biff per se. So we're gonna head north to see where this rock changes and our lithology changes. Okay, we're still on that same cliff base. We're not that far north. Maybe a couple, few, few dozen feet, tens of meters, whatever. The rock hasn't changed that much. You can still see pretty much how it was. Still get laminations of ferrous slate, and it's all rusted here. So lithology hasn't changed too, too much. When we get here, and even the pile is colored different. But remember, color is not conducive of a lithology change or even identification. We look at this rock up close and it's still laminated as it was there, but iron dominates over a classic material like shale and siltstone. So I am going to put my contact between the two right about here. Uh, I will take a sample of it, and then we're gonna keep moving on a little further. Okay, you look at these rocks here. This is still in that transition for where the rock becomes more iron mineral dominated than clastic. And you see how it's this dark gray to black metallic looking. And you turn this way, and behind me in the ground, you see a similar color, all right? Now, I know I said color is not diagnostic of lithology, but here we do see some color trends. You saw the rusty one there. You saw metallic dark here. There's a very light one over there that's also visible down there on the other side of the dark metallic looking stuff down there, which is also up here. So that can tell us, now we'd have to physically go down there, and we will, to see if that is in place or if that's just float that someone just happened to plow up that way. But if it's not, and that's why you still have to go down there, that's a way you can correlate what's in this cliff face to what's down there, if that holds up. Hopefully I'll remember <laughs> that I had this conversation with you when we get down there, and I can talk about it some more. That lighter unit that I just showed you down there in the low area does kind of follow strike anyway. But here it is, an outcrop. This weed is coincidentally just right about where this lighter colored stuff starts. And I put the engineering rule here because we have about 1.4 feet of gradation. So the contact between a really hematitic stuff and this, which I haven't looked at yet, is about 1.4 feet. And that's why we use this. I haven't taken striker dip yet. I think I am going to take a sample of this. Uh, but I logged it just to show you how my notes are progressing. I'm doing stops 1A, B, C. All right. That's how I'm doing it. And I'm walking here as I go. This is not going to be to scale because I won't be able to do that because we have to go way up there. So that's how I'm writing these notes right now, logging every picture I take. And that's generally how I'm doing this. There's that lighter unit. And here we see another change. This stuff is interesting too. You look at it from the talus, I mean, it becomes ferrous again. We're getting out of clastics again. And this is kind of what made me originally think there was a tight fold here, because we have this nice stuff here, and then we have more ferrous slates down there, but we're missing all the units in between, so that can't be it. What more likely is happening here, based on the strikes and dips too, is that it's just a repeat in lithology, but the lithology is a bit different. The rock trend has not changed, really, at all. The strike, the dip was originally pointing this way, but nearly vertical, and now it's swung this way. That happens, formations can be overturned in places and not overturned in others. Not a big deal, especially when they're this close to vertical. 
but we look at some of this stuff here, and it does become more ferrous again. Look at this green stuff in here. And you can probably see from the camera, this is sandstone. And this, although it doesn't look identical to my rock, does look a lot like, at first glance, I have to look at it under hand lens, like it might have some of that weird looking stuff I saw under microscope there. Now this unit is, does, and you can tell by looking at it, the weather's different. It's not as angular. It's a little more, more random too, and not as nice and even as it previously has been. And you look at the other float here, and you see what looks like mud cracks. You see that? In it. Okay, so more evidence that banded iron formations are sedimentary, but we kind of already know that. At least that much about them. <laughs> so, I can't really take that sandstone, actually, now that I look at it, because it's not in place. I did take an in-place sample. So I don't want to say that this is the unit it's definitely from, but I think we're probably close. And as you can see, if you look this way, we're running out of cliff, and we're just getting into talus. So we're going to come down here, confirm if the colors that are reflected here are the same trend there, and explore this rock. But we're going to go down there now and complete the picture. Just going to stop here real quick and show you this. A lot of times, this is as good as exposures get. This is in place. If you turn directly around, you can see it's directly in line and strike with that edge of the cliff right there. So you know this rock is in place. And you see this probably quartz, pretty pure quartz that kind of continues and it goes through here. I'm just gonna log this and take a structural measurement uh, just so you can kind of see if it continues that trend. I can't really get a dip off this because it's too buried, but I can get a strike to at least confirm that it's on par with that side of the rock. So I'm gonna do that, take a picture of it, and then we'll go back to that cliff over there. Now, you know, we're gonna lose it if I take you up there, but first, this is about the area the loose sandstone was found, right here. Not in place, obviously. You see the light unit behind me that I already talked about while we were up there? You can still see it from here. If we go over all the way on top of it, you won't be able to. And I can tell you already, because I've measured it, that it is continuous. So the light, the light rock here is correlative with the light rock up there. Up the hill, that's probably just where they piled it and scraped it off. So let's go see and let's go examine this wall. We're on that light unit I just showed you, which is in line with the white one up the hill, or the lighter one. Let's call you white, that's not correct. But here it looks different. And I am gonna sample it. You see a lot of green here. This is sericite on it. It's a mineral. But you look at the stuff and closely, and it, this is a quartzite here, all right? So it means it's parent rock is a sandstone, kind of like a lot of the jasper in this is here, except here it's green. And I'm looking at this, and I already took a measurement. It, it is in line with everything. There's nothing wrong here. We have a slight facies change, or not. <laughs> Depends on what you define as facies change. The sericite, is here, but it didn't seem to be up there, although that yellow color could still be it, just not in high enough concentration. That's why I'm taking samples so I can actually do lab analysis on these in detail. But we definitely, this is definitely a quartzite, or a proto-quartzite, or something like that. An immature quartzite. I, it probably, by looking at it, it probably is quartzite. The dominant mineral here is probably quartz. So we got a little bit of something going on here that's a little different from the standard banded iron formation. And like I said, you know, other than the fact that we're in the Vulcan and we know that the felch underlies the Vulcan, we're, going, we're not dealing with members here because I'm trying to define this as we go. So I'm going to 
get the GPS coordinate for this, take a sample of this so it can be analyzed in the lab in greater detail. And then we are going to go to the cliff that's right there now, I swear, really close to it. It's like right there. Okay, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, basic observations before I take measurements and samples. Uh, that way's north, pretty much. And you look at this float, and you see we have another change. You see that a greenish color again, but there's almost no sand in here. There are plastics, but it's more clay par sized particles. But you can see things like ripple marks. So if that was in place, that'd be a key indicator of which direction is up here and that we have a bedding plane. Do we have other indicators? So we could try to figure out if that way actually is up section. So we come over here and we look at this unit and we see a lot of weathering features, chemical differences caused by metamorphism. So I'm looking for things like ripple marks and mud cracks, things like that. And there are some ripples here, but they're really subtle. So I'm going to look for something else. You see these, this is kind of cool here. You see these swirls? This is close to a bedding plane. I know that because of the faint ripples there. But what's up with these swirls? Is this iron mineralization or something like that? Or how do you pronounce it? Leisging <laughs> rings, I believe is how it's pronounced. You look at the rock here and you see it's very iron rich. The answer is no, it's not Leisging rings. And sorry, I'll correct it <laughs> on screen if. I am probably butchering the word. It's not something I say very often. Uh, but you look at this. These are probably fossils. These are probably stromatolites. Now, there's no mounds here, but there's rings of them. We know they form mats, and we know they form mounds, and they can form other things. And there are parts that are slightly more clastic in here that aren't just iron. Like, you can see the iron formation here. So these are probably likely stromatolites or something like that, some sort of biological activity. But that can't tell us which way is up. And here you see chemical, you see these dendritic patterns from crystallization. You get these, this is not a fossil. This is mineralization, you can tell. You have fractures and it kind of bleeds out from the fractures. So it's post deposition, post deformation, post metamorphism, probably relatively modern. That probably is from groundwater movement and it cross cuts its beds and fractures. I will take fracture measurements here as well. I'm not seeing anything that stands out as a primary sedimentary feature like a ripple mark or mud cracks, not right here. Undulating ripple marks on it, but I can't tell up from that. I just saw some in two places on the same bedding plane. Mud cracks, mud cracks, and mud cracks. You look down on this, this is a bedding plane that comes straight up. See? There's my bedding plane. So we have mud cracks, well developed mud cracks here. So we know this is either the top or bottom of a bed. Well, how can we tell? The only way for me to do that is to break it and to see if the cracks are wider up here. But I, I don't need to do that. Uh, I'm just gonna, Sarah's gonna stay there. I don't want her coming over here. She doesn't have the right foot gear for this. When you look at it here in cross section, clean that off a bit. This is better actually. See the mud cracks? You go into the bed Oh, <laughs> they disappear. They're gone. See? Mud cracks that just fell from there. Same. Mud cracks? No mud cracks. What does that tell us? Well, mud cracks form from the drying of mud. So they form on the surface, on the top. So this tells us that this is the top of the bed because they don't propagate through even, what is that? four millimeters, half a centimeter maybe at the most. I don't even go that deep. So that tells us this is the top of a bed. And since this is the same bed, this is the top of the bed. So that tells us 
that top is younger. So this bed is younger than this bed, which is younger than that bed way up there. So younging, you know, the rock's getting younger, and we're not talking billions of years here. We're talking, in this case, this thing was probably deposited within maybe a couple million at the most, probably less than that. But you, as you go south, you are getting into younger beds because this stuff was originally deposited nearly level. And then, because it's sedimentary, we don't get mud cracks forming on mountainsides. So that tells us something happened to this after deposition. And we've been getting strikes and dips of bedding all along. So this would have been deposited level, pretty close to it. A degree or two, who cares? It's not the end of the world. Not when stuff's deformed like this. And it just got buried. And at some point it got deformed and tilted and metamorphosed to the present position it's in now. So our dip is here, is back it looks again towards the south. So that's how we interpret these things. We know primary sedimentary structures don't form on vertical cliffs. They form on nearly level beds or such a thing as initial dip. We are aware of these things, but even initial dip, you're not gonna get good developed mud cracks like this uh, uh, if you have a lot of initial dip. So now I'm gonna start taking measurements here and we still haven't found the sandstone. <sighs> All right, I found the sandstone. There's the wall. We just were the north wall. So I'm heading west. I'm going around. And you can see that lighter color unit that correlates with the lighter one up there. Oh, I noticed this. there's some beautiful quartz in here. All right, so there's that. Let me get back into this darker unit. And if you look at the wall over there, you see this rusty, really rusty thing in the middle. Watch that marker. It's not an actual lithology change. It's just a chemical change because you get here and you're on it. So here's that really rusty layer. Then it comes up right over here. Big chunks of the sandstone right under that really rusty unit, which is in my field book. This is why we write things down. At the ferrous slate, I had the light unit. And my rusty unit, it's rusty, but it's not an actual lithology change. That's gonna come up. See how rusty comes up? It's in this unit. So it comes up here. That's our rustiness. So our sandstone is right on top of that. Remember, we now know younging is to the south. So this is younger than the beds that are rusty. So our sandstone, it's about right here. So we can know for sure, and I will take detailed measurements. So you look at it, it's a little different, and it changes, and it's covered out there. And it looks like it peters out where the main rust is in the east cliff. But you look at it, and you look at the stuff in place, and this here, which I already pulled at, it's a lot more hematitic, a lot more hematite, but it's very sandy this unit and I looked at it under hand lens and I'm starting to see some of the quartz that it's similar to the other one which makes me think this has to be the sandstone unit uh, this is a big chunk of it right here look at this under hand lens and it looks a lot like my sandstone unit now to confirm that I will have to do petrographic analysis from samples I will take from here to be sure. But based on field relations, I think this is where it came from. And actually it wasn't found that far from here. You know, it was like right over there. So it makes sense that it was somewhere from here. So I'm gonna measure this, take samples, and then we're gonna go up and around, see if we can find the contact with the Randville. This is probably the, this is the Vulcan iron formation. If that rusty stuff does mean something other than later weathering, maybe it's an old paleosol, an old geosol, you know, soil development on top when this stuff was deposited. Now you didn't have plants then, but you could get chemical soils. So that could be what that is, uh, if it's not, if it's primary and not secondary. But I'm not really interested in that. But it would make, but they would mean that's 
the contact with the underlying Felch formation, which we know would have to be to the north, since we know rocks get younger that way, and the Vulcan Iron formation is younger than the Felch. And we don't see any evidence of hard faulting here or crazy folding or anything like that. It's pretty much just a vertical succession. So basically, if you start at where the truck is parked and you start walking north, you're basically walking down section. So you're getting into older and older rock. Uh, so that's, that's a good thing about vertical exposures. But I'm gonna study this and, and Sarah's gonna do some rock collecting. There's our rusty unit in about the center there. And it comes down. You can see it's right here right in front of me. Zoom out some more. And I'm measuring the thickness of the sandstone. All right, it's definitely younger than this rusty stuff. We have a little bit of change here, and then boom. This is about where it starts, my tape measure. So we come south, follow it, getting younger. This is definitely what strongly resembles it. We come this way, and by the time we get here, it's gone. And we see in place there that doesn't look like it. We see some up there, so it's probably more like right here. So probably between five and six feet is how thick this unit is. And like I said, it appears to completely pinch out before you get there. Actually, the gray part seems to pinch out before you even get to that first talus. And I don't know how far it goes this way, but it probably doesn't get any thicker. So, I, like I said, I have to do petrographic analysis to determine for sure if this is the same rock as the loose one, but I think it is. And then we'll try to interpret origins after that. There's Sarah down there collecting some rock. Okay, that way is south. That is basically the top of the cliffs. I'm looking for the contact between the Felch Formation and the Ranville Dolomite. I don't think that's going to happen. That's concrete right there. Uh, this is basically north. You can see the hill here. You look at it. I've wandered over there a little bit. It's glacial. So this whole hill is glacial. Uh, I have not checked down there yet. That's where I'm going to go to make sure and see if I can find anything. And up there is our second site anyway. But uh, we're going to actually drive to that second site. But I'm not seeing the contact. And uh, we don't see the contact of the Vulcan with the Michigami either here. So I was hoping, but you know, I'll wander around a little bit more and, and see. But look at those fall colors. This is from that 1904 publication by Bailey. This wasn't exposed then. And this is the Trader Slate. And he has Keel Ridge Pit. That's where we're going after lunch next. And you can see there's some tight folding here that looks a lot like the what might be Pompelli's rule being expressed in the northwest corner there at that biff. Uh, here we don't see, you know, strong evidence of tight folding. But just to show you where we are, where I was, this is, uh, we're parked, uh, there's the barn. Oh, we're parked right about here came up here I went all the way up here and this is where I found the boulders and I couldn't find the Ranville and I, their boulders of Sturgeon Quartzite we know this quarry is the Ranville we know that and our strike is about this way so that makes sense because the Ranville would be stratigraphically below we know older's this way so the Ranville's older so that would be about right and if it was exposed it should have been up here but you know there's been so much reworking here it wasn't seen we are going here now when i came up here before sarah went back down to pick to pick up some rocks uh, when i came up here i went to the northwest part it went right about here and that's about where i saw what i think is pompelli's rule expressed in that rock up there you can see it over here but anyway we're going to actually drive up here after lunch just so we can be right there so we've answered some questions here about the stratigraphy and the orientation of the rock of the Vulcan banded iron formation here. I still am not sure about how many uh, of those members are legitimate. And that quarry wall on the north side likely is the Felch formation right below it. And below that should be the Ranville, which is not exposed. And I think I found where he came from. 
All right, the, the, the samples I got are not as coarse grained as this, but it does resemble this a lot. I could not find anything that looked exactly like this. It could be buried now under all the workings and stuff like that. But I'm pretty confident that we found this and that we are answering some questions about the banded iron here. So tentatively right now, if this is stratigraphically where it is, the Sudbury impact ejecta is near the base of the Michigami formation, which is younger than this and supposedly in contact with it in the actual Keel mine where the Home Depot now sits. But unfortunately, no Michigami is exposed here either. So that's where the Sudbury impact ejecta should be, not in here. But that doesn't mean that's not Sudbury impact ejecta. It could be the Vulcan iron formation is at 1.85 billion years old or slightly younger. You know, a million years here or there isn't the you know end all be all. So is this ejecta? I don't know, still hasn't been rolled out. But we did see that stuff like this kind of petered out as we went east along the, where, where it should have been. So it could be a local deposition of ejecta or reworked ejecta, something like that. But we're gonna go to lunch and then we're gonna go to our second stop. Okay, it's about quarter to two, October 10th. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, wait, there it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are going to explore the area of the old keel pit, not the keel mine. Most of it's behind us. Uh, That's where they dug out. You can see it's filled in. There's nothing there anymore. When you look behind me, you see banded iron formation here. Now, it looks a little bit jumbled here, but we'll come back to this. What I want to point out here right now is the fact you can see the top of where the glacial stuff came in. You see the nice banded iron formation. You know, the dark rock, the rusty red rock, and all of a sudden it just planes off and it slopes back, and then you get sand with just boulders and gravel in it. That is the glacial stuff on top of the biff, which is banded iron formation. Come this way. And we aren't that far from the last place we were at. We're basically just west off the northwest corner. Now, we come this way, the banded iron formation. Also a little bit hard to tell orientation structure here, but it's here. It's still the Vulcan. This is all still the Vulcan. You get right here, and you can see the banded iron formation here, and you can see bedding. It uh, looks like it's going about this way, which is about, I believe, this North 63 West trend. About, I mean, of course, I'm going to go through all this in detail, but I think it's about the same. Uh, about, no, it's not. It is steeply dipping, but the orientation is different. This does not follow that North 63 West strike. And you can kind of see it's kind of shallow here. It's not as vertical. And we can tell that bedding is, bedding is like this. So it's dipping north here, but obviously nowhere near it's like this, as steep as it was in the other pit. Let me come this way a little bit. Something changes right here. Bedding on this is right here. This is it. Uh, strike, which is almost east-west. So we dip shallowly to the north. Whoa. That's a huge difference from more dipping that way, which probably is closer to our North 60-ish trend. Like I said, I gotta measure it. And then our really steep vertical stuff there. We've got this little bit right here in between that's odd. So, geologically, What's going on with this here? I already know, but I'm gonna take you through our process. Okay, that way's west. We were just there, showed you the beds are dipping pretty much on strike-ish, you know, bending a little, and not quite as steeply there in place. And to the east, 
we have our north 63 west trend dipping almost vertically with those possible Pompelli type reflections in it, which is probably, you know, correlative to the furthest south unit on the east wall, that quarry, which this probably is too. But here, something's different. The beds are more level. Strike is almost east-west, which isn't what we expect. What's going on? Well, let's go through the possibilities. There could be faults here, because you can see the more traditional bedding of the Biff over there in the higher cliff. And one in that little valley just past these trees here. That could be a fault. Those could be faults. And this could be fault bounded and moved by faults. But I don't think it is. There's something else going on here if you look at the topography. And looking at topography can really help you out. Now, just right there, like just where we were, we have a high cliff. You see the contact with the glacial, it's sharp, you know what's going on. Back there to the east, same thing. And then stuff's in place and all that stuff. The North 63 West trending thing. Okay, so we have a continuous, which should be a continuous wall. It would be very unusual to have a fault bounded structure within stuff like that. It wouldn't be impossible, but it would be difficult. Now, we don't see any evidence of faulting if we climb up here. We just see more banded iron formation, more chunks of banded iron formation there. But look at this topography. Okay, we're getting low on batteries. I'm going to try to make this fast. So we know we have good cliffs to the west, good cliffs to the east, stuff in place. This is not in place. If you look at the hill here, you see this U-shaped valley in between here. This is slump. This is a chunk of the iron and glacial that has slumped down. It sticks out further, closer to the road than any other outcrop. You know, it, it, and it's rotated too. This stuff would have been normal trend, almost vertical. And when this slumped, it rotated more level. That is what went on here more than likely. You can see it's free of trees too. So this isn't a fault bounded structure or anything like that. It's likely just an earth movement, a slump. When the slump happened, I can't tell you. I don't know. You know, uh, we got some trees in here that look to be about my age. Uh, there's some older in the back. So probably no more than 50 years ago. And that could have just been from people digging out and loosening the cliff because they would have dug this drainage ditch and the biff doesn't hold up well in some places and it just could have slumped down. That's likely what happened here. And the biff here and everywhere throughout the area is the most likely unit to deform in between like the Ranville, uh, aside from the Michigami. But exposed, the biff is the most likely to bend and fall. And it's also the most likely to weather, break, and fail because the dominant iron minerals will rust out. <laughs> so, you know, that's where you get the red-brown color. So this is probably just a slump. But I think I'm just gonna take some measurements and then we're going to move along. See, here's a slump. See how bended and random it looks? Let's see. This is right here and then you get right here. You start to see more traditional dipping banded iron formation. So the earth failure scarf's probably right there. And you see banded iron formation up there. So it's a, it's a slump. I'm going to go back to, that's the northwest corner where I was before. I'm going to come in just a little bit. I will get measurements here. I'm probably not going to take too many samples. I'm pretty confident it's all the same unit. I'm going to get a lot of structural measurements through here. That's more key right here. This is stop 2A, and you look down here and you can see we have more tight, what looks like tight folds in here. And we didn't see these down in that lower pit. Once it came up here, you started seeing it. Now, they, it is, I guess, possible that it could be biological in origin. Uh, I did measure the, what I thought were tight folds in the last outcrop, but, I haven't had time to actually, you know, go through it and look at it and see if it does express Pompelli's rule or not. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, so the banded iron formation here, you can tell, is pretty laminated. You still see some primary structures on the float. 
and you do see some stuff like some thin to medium beds, but you see the laminations here. You see the hematitic layers. You see some busted up plastics, this rusty looking stuff. Uh, it's also possible that these could have been primary folds due to something like storm activity or something. But let's keep going. So this is our stop 2B. And you can still see, we see some of what looks like tight folding in here too. I'm starting to wonder if these aren't some sort of primary structure and not later folds because you can see it come down here and just kind of peters out. This is more traditionally bedded. So maybe it is biological or some sort of weather phenomena preserved like a storm ripple, because this is lenticular. You see this here? This would be the nose of a fold if we were expressing Pompelli's rule. See in the one here and you come here and it should reflect the other way, but it actually comes back around and pinches out. So we have a lens here, if you can see that. So yeah, I'm beginning to think these are not secondary folds, that this unit contains these as primary structures. What those primary structures are, I have no idea. So the sun came out and it's only 75 degrees, but it's like 90% humidity, so it's just sweating. And I'm dirty, but dirty is how you know you're doing it right. If you're not dirty, you're doing it wrong. Some of you have already seen some of my posts and, okay. Now, no, I can't do that yet. I'll do that in the field if I remember. This way, and then we'll... No, were you recording? No. Oh. If you want, if you can get a little closer. I mean, can you see all the flab in its glory? I think it's sexy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Ah, I was hoping this would be good ripples. Um, it's really not. <sighs> Trying to see, to just show you which way's up. I don't want to walk too, too much on the callus, halus, whatever. Can really help you think it's a it's just a ladybug. No. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I understand. And looking at topography.